Hi, everybody. I'm Mike. I do customer marketing uh, here at Evertrue. And I, I know like a good amount of, of you in the room. Um, and I am so excited that that's the case. Because my job at Evertrue is really just to talk to customers so that we can make different decisions based on what you tell us. And like, I mean, the thing that resonated with me um, from, from Wambi's talk is we have to go out and we have to listen to what our audience want. Like, what's the event that they want? What are the stories they want to hear from campus? What do they want to give money towards? And how can we make that happen? How can we work together with our alumni, with our parents, with our friends, with our donors to take what they want and translate that to action? So that was my key takeaway from, uh, from that session, as well as I'm buying my wife a card on the way home uh, uh, before, before I get back. Um, I have the pleasure and the privilege to be hosting our next panel, which is all about video, growing your donor base through powerful video. And so I'm going to give you three stats. One third of all online activity is spent watching video. So one out of every three of you who's on your phone right now is watching a video instead of listening to me. More video content is uploaded in 30 days than all three major US TV networks have combined to create in the last 30 years. A lot of people are making, creating, and sharing videos. And after watching videos, 64%, so two out of every three users, are more likely to buy a product online. So video is powerful for converting folks. So we're going to bring in a CEO, a marketing expert, and a uh, content creator on stage. And we're going to talk about video. So come on up, everybody. Return to the Mac. Get him what it is, what it does, what it is, what it isn't. Looking for a better way to get up out of bed instead of getting on the internet. Or I would maybe dance, but probably not. Um, Go for it. Yeah, all right. So, um, I introduce myself. Hi, I'm Mike. I do marketing at Evertrue. But now we're going to go left to right and have each of you introduce yourself, uh, what your role is, and uh, your favorite movie. Hmm. And so, Chris, you go, you're first. All right. Uh, my name is Chris Savage. I'm the co founder and CEO of a company called Wistia. We're a video platform for marketers, so hosting, analytics, tools to make sure that you understand the impact that your videos are having. We also have a product called Soapbox, which is a Chrome extension that makes it really easy for one person to make a video for another person. Um, I would say my favorite, my favorite movie, that's the last question. Favorite movie. You know, that's a really tough one. Uh, it kind of depends on my mood. You know, what am I feeling? Do I want to watch something I've seen before? I will say, um, What's popping into my head at this exact moment is the movie Gladiator with Russell Crowe. <laughs> <laughs> a little embarrassing, but I'll put it out there, you know? It's, it's I'm a, a fan. I'm a fan of the story. It's a good date night movie. Yeah, perfect yeah. date night movie. <laughs> uh, I'm Christy Keim. I'm the director for alumni digital engagement at Emerson College. Um, currently building a team right now and uh, a digital engagement um, program and strategy for alumni at Emerson. Um, and uh, my favorite movie, I, whenever it's on TV, I watch it. It's Mean Girls. <laughs> there you go. I'm not awesome. a mean girl, yeah. but I do. <laughs> Great I film. It. You're not. Okay, you're not. Um, my name is Awesome Elise Mayfield, and I am the senior manager of uh, engagement and programs at Boston Medical Center. Um, there, I work on internal communications that focus on getting the people at BMC to engage with all of the things that we offer them um, and sort of creating cohesive um, engagement suites from video to print to digital um, that help with those efforts. I don't have a favorite movie, but if, it's, if there's something that's on I'm going to stop and watch, probably Anchorman. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> that, I, was, I mean, I don't watch a lot of movies. I've been to the, I've been to the movies uh, once in the last 18 months. Um, but Anchorman is also my favorite film. It's so. that good. It has good quotables. That's good, great quotables. It's got have quotables. I mean, applications for everyday life. You know, you can get your mantra. You know, all of that. <laughs> um, uh, real quick, we're gonna watch a clip in just a minute. But um, in one or two sentences, um, and we're gonna go backwards. We'll start with Austin. But like, why, why, why are we talking about video? Why should we care? Because you made me. No. Um, <laughs> Video is inescapable. It's um, 
it's immersive, um, it works the way our brains work, um, and I think it continues to be one of the most um, efficient way of messaging. Yeah, um, that's kind of what I was going to say. Um, I think video can be um, one of the most effective, authentic ways to share an emotion that you want to transfer to your audience um, to get them to act on something or feel something or uh, be aware of something. Agree with both of you. Um, I would say that our culture shifted and people have an expectation that they're going to be able to read something or listen to it or watch it. Like I think our audience wants control of how they consume content. Um, and so you know, we're talking about video because if the audience wants that and you're not delivering on it, then you're missing an opportunity to connect with the way people actually want to connect. Yeah, and when we miss those connections, that's where we lose donors. That's where we lose, disengage people. That's where we uh, get more people ignoring phone calls versus picking it up. Um, how many folks here are on their marketing team? Handful. I, I looked at the attendee list. It's about 10, 15% of us. So that means for the rest of us in the room, uh, you're like, OK, how does this apply to me? And so we're going to show a clip that uh, Wistia produced talking about uh, a concept called 1, 10, 100. I don't think we've ever gotten to do something like this in the nine year history of sandwich video. They say creativity is born out of constraint. But on the other hand, shouldn't more money make the creative process easier? Let me try to take one, Mark. I have a lot uh, riding on this, personally. <laughs> the first cut, you watch it and your heart sinks and it's just like, ooh, they really tried something there, but it did not work. We're Wistia, and this is 110100, a documentary series where we challenged a video production agency to make three videos at three very different price points. One for $1,000, one for $10,000, and one video for $100,000. That's the biggest light stand I've ever seen. Join us as we discover how money can simplify, complicate, and ultimately change the creative process. We aren't off schedule as much as we just altered the schedule. 40 people in your space, you know, moving heavy equipment, it put me a little on edge. If you're missing a shot, you can't just go back and tear apart the office and rebuild it. You have to make sure that you have everything on the day and that it's going to work in post. We'll uncover how creative professionals allocate money as their budgets increase. Uh, can we do our own makeup? No. And are we in this? Yes. So do we not want to look like sh We get the hair and makeup person. Experience what it's like to be on the set of a big budget video. Oh, this is an area of mirror. Sides. Tiny script. Lavalier. Tiny microphone. Hi-hat. Tiny tripod. Pony. Tiny horse. Well played. And watch a Hollywood director make a video with an iPhone. It's kind of made me reframe in my head what you really need to put out a good video. So what does it take to make a great video? In the grand scheme of things, maybe the videos that we've produced, the 1K, the 10K, and the 100K, maybe there isn't as big of a difference as people might think. You see that? This is, yeah, I got some, yeah, I got that. It's great. This is 110-100. So, Three advertisements for the same thing created with three very different budgets. What did you learn? Yeah, so um, we did that project because one of the most common questions we get is, how much should I spend on my video? What difference does it make? Um, and we're in a fortunate situation to be able to like take that, that budget of $111,000 and make those three ads. And I would say the funny thing you know, to really learn, you should watch the full documentary, available at <laughs> yeah. um, But. Uh, uh, the thing that we learned that's really interesting and kind of counterintuitive is that it's actually easier to be creative with smaller budgets. So that $100,000 video, there's like 40 people on set that day, crazy scripting that's done, crazy amount of planning, and if you have an idea that pops up on that day that you want to do, you basically, if it's new, they're not prepared, their actor isn't there, whatever, you, you can't do it. And the $1,000 video, um, and you probably, I would, you should go check out all these ads because everyone likes to guess which one is their favorite. But the $1,000 video, the guy who shot it, he shot it the first day and then he's like, well, I guess I'll just try again tomorrow. <laughs> and he tried again the second day and he did some other things and it ended up being really creative and really fun and, and it really stood out um, in a major way. And the, the folks at Sandwich were incredibly generous with us to do this project because what the projects that they work on are normally the like, $100,000 to $200,000 budget per video. Um, but yeah, I think it's, it, 
creativity is much easier when you're smaller. And I think it's, we did it to encourage folks to like take a risk and try something. Um, because video is the most emotional medium that is out there, and yet it can feel so scary to get started with that. Um, that's what we hear a lot is like, oh, I don't want to be on camera. Just like, I'm not comfortable public speaking. And then people don't give it a shot, and yet that's what our audiences want. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, we just watched uh, a room of 250 people take selfies together. Like, we can do, we have great video recording equipment in our pockets and in the palm of our hands everywhere we go. And we can be sharing really authentic stories in real time with everyone we're interacting with. So instead of shooting an email, shoot a video, send it off. Christy, um, talk about, um, you know, Talk about those, uh, those test projects. We have, we have a clip that, that you worked on, um, yeah. but like, what, what does that look like to try to get started and do video and, and put yeah. it out there? Um, well, especially right now at Emerson, since I'm, I'm new, we're testing out a lot of different theories. Um, high production value, very low end production value, what kind of content is resonating, um, and really depends on um, it, it's heavily weighs on your content and how that gets expressed in the video that you're shooting, um, whether it's shot on an iPhone or whether you have a full production team um, involved. It's it's um, heavily um, heavily on the content and also that emotion we are talking about, um, emulating that emotion to your audience. And uh, and if, if folks are just trying to start out with some ideas, um, how did Talk about the live streaming that you yeah. did at BU and yep. like what, what does that look like? I know you guys worked on it together and also oh. Phil DiMartino, formula of BU, now Five Tools Production, is, uh, was heavily involved in that as well. So, yeah. Yeah, um, so it's, I mean, that was a very low and low production value shot on an iPhone, uh, Facebook Live. Um, I would say the only added technology we had was a lavalier. Um, audio is extremely important when you're, um, um, when you're shooting a video. So um, when you see the example, it's, um, I, I specifically chose this because it is so low end. Um, the, visual, the visual is not great. Um, the audio is okay. Uh, there's no stabilization involved. And um, yet it turned over really great engagement and great results. And um, we had a lot of positive feedback from that. I told Austin to close her eyes because I don't think she wants to take credit for this, but... Um. I, have, I have other clips. <laughs> Can we roll that uh, clip from the BU Theater Project? This is the Studio Theater. It's voluminous. Uh, we can, we can hold, uh, accommodate 250 to 260 patrons in here. What you're looking at uh, through the floor level there is this is fully trapped. So. It gives the theater a lot of flexibility to do all kind of cool things with their shows. But in a regular state, the floor level will be where we're standing now, and you won't see into the trap room. That's something that will come very late in the construction uh, as they tr start to finish this thing up. There are two gallery levels. The lower of the two levels will be something that is uh, used by the public uh, and the BU community. And then the upper one is a much more technical gallery that primarily will be used for uh, lighting positions and theatrical effects and those types of things. So one of the things that we don't like the term black box, which is what a lot of these spaces tend to be called, because this is really so much more than that. There is going to, yes, it's going to be dark and painted out and highly flexible. It's essentially a laboratory for theater. So the students can learn everything that they need in the world of theater can essentially take place in this uh, machine for theater. So let's just hold this uh, image just for a second. But like, we're all raising money for buildings, and we all have like these, these beautiful schematics, you know, with like the little plastic people like in the front or whatever. You know, this is a live schematic. The guy's standing inside the theater, he's talking about what the impact of this space will be, and then look at the folks like engaging with this. 62 shares, you know, a couple hundred likes. How many, how many like non-donors or your next major gift donor are saying that like, I want to be part of this right there? And then how are, how are you how are you taking those insights and then and yeah. then converting them to action? Yeah, in this case in particular, it was for a new the new booth theater. Um, and what we were able to do using Evertrue actually um, is take and this by the way was just 
a, a trial. Um, and we are able to pull rated prospects and then also take the broader list and use that as an annual, targeted annual giving solicitation email. Um, it turns out there are a lot of people uh, that didn't necessarily major in theater that have an interest in theater and didn't know about this building and really wanted to be a part of it. And I don't want to step on Christy's toes because this is her clip, but this was not just the, oh, we're going to just walk down there. So Phil and I went down, met with the architects. We did a full practice walkthrough. So, and also he has a great accent. Who doesn't love that? Yeah. Anybody wants to listen to that guy? He's, he's the best. Get you an architect with an accent. And then also, um, <laughs> while Dave, who was doing the live filming, was, was doing that, we followed them around. I wasn't on set, but they were followed around and we got other content. So the content from this was then packaged into a more narrative info video because people were concerned and worried and interested about what that move from the Huntington Theater was going to mean for, you know, the College of the Art, the College School of Art, School of Theater. Theater. See, all of that, I said. But so the point is, it was important and people were ready and they wanted that. So yes, like, you know, you can do something very authentic, very useful, very informative, um, and still get a lot of great content and engagement out of it. Yeah. And that's content and engagement like on a broad schedule, but, uh, uh, but when we were talking about this session, Austin, you had some like really great ideas for, okay, if I'm a frontline fundraiser, if I'm out there, you know, I'm doing the one-on-one -on -one <laughs> meetings or the one-on-two -on -two meetings, how, how can I use video and how should I be working with my communications team? And the biggest thing is I know at, you know, I was at BU previously and we would have folks running down the hall when it was time for proposals and that's important. You've got to get those proposals from your comms folks if you're in a shop that's set up that way. But being proactive, taking the comms people out to lunch um, or just asking <laughs> them, hey, what does your content calendar look like? Some of the best um, relationships that I built with frontline fundraisers at BU were people who were just interested in what was going on and availed themselves of you know what was happening or if you know it's like well we're gonna talk to this professor about this or like oh that's great because I know that this major prospect was thinking about this so let me shoot you a couple questions and so when you get those can I have them you know just be proactive and don't wait for a video necessarily to come to you and don't necessarily wait to create a one-off special video for this one donor who's maybe on the fence like that sometimes that works but a lot of times it's those more organic interactions that really make the difference. Yeah. So how many of you who are not in communications know what's on the communications calendar? Oh, my team's raising their hand. We got a, we got a, we got a bunch. This is actually a really good sign. If you don't know your communications team, take them out to lunch, find out what's on the calendar, and uh, see how you can use it. How many of you are subscribed to your organization's YouTube channel? They know if you're lying. Handful. All right, everybody, this is a moment you can take out your phones while we transition to the next question. Search for your organization and hit the bell on YouTube. That'll subscribe you. You get a notification anytime a new video gets posted. And that's something that you can then use for your own outreach. You can send to a donor. You can use for stewardship. You can figure out how to get into a meeting, like do all that. I see uh, our friends from Kansas State clapping over there. So this is, this is good stuff. Good thing. All right. Videos, stories that. Uh, Tell stories the way your brain wants to understand them so that you can drive action. What do we need to know about driving action using video? What's the secret? I mean, I would, I would say the secret is um, figure out what your goal is up front. And you know, there's a tendency with video to try to do too many things with each, with, okay. with each goal, with each video. And I think your example was perfect of like, all right, we just want to bring people inside and see what their money would actually impact. And there's a very emotional connection and it feels so authentic and real. Um, but the thing that I always see that gets people tripped up is they, they get worried, they're gonna make a video, they're gonna put budget towards it, or they're gonna take someone's time, or they're gonna get on camera, and then they start thinking of like the 20 things that should happen with that. And it, it, when you put too much in, it gets discombobulated around what's actually working. Mm -hmm. And so if it's a video on the site and it's trying to get uh, people to re-engage with you, you should put a story in there that has a clear goal at the end of it. 
Um, if you are making one-to-one -one videos for somebody and the goal is literally to get them to respond or engage or come to an event or whatever it is, just start with the goal. And you'll be surprised how often when you do that, um, you end up realizing that the video you want to make is actually not the right one to make. Yeah, that's um, very, I agree. Um, know what your action is. Know what the action that you want your audience to take. Um, before you even start any sort of production. Um, whether it's you want them to do something, you want them to feel something, or you just want to put a smile on their face or be aware of what is going on. Um, but know, yeah, know that and stay focused on that goal. Um, and I will be the hard edge person that will say, do not make videos to fundraise. That should not be your goal. Have a goal, it should not be that. The only the only fundraising video that works is Sarah McLaughlin with the sad puppies and the <laughs> MSPCA. Unless you are them, do not do that. Your, I, your focus should be, like it doesn't work for Lexus. Lexus spends $4 million on 30 second commercials. Do you like, huh, that was expensive. I'm gonna go buy a Lexus. No, you don't because that's not what they do. They're priming. So don't make a video to fundraise, make a video to engage, make um, make a video to to share, to inform. But if you're making fundraising videos, you're likely um, selling yourself short and your audience is short. Just to build on that, I feel like that's so on the money. And like the, the way that I think about it is, especially in the context of you're trying to get alumni to come back and re-engage, if you just ask them for money. It's panhandling. They're, they're yeah, they just, they're like, you're not giving me anything. <laughs> you have to give them something mm -hmm. in the content. You have, to, you have to teach them something, you have to educate them with something, you can help them with their current career. You can, it, whatever it is, and that's the connection that people, that's gonna create the connection, and if you're, help, if you're constantly continuing to educate and continuing to help, then it's easy for someone to, to donate at that point. Create beautiful moments, right? Like mm -hmm. we just heard. Uh, speaking of, you guys are teeing this up, great. We have a third clip to show you of a way to do that, to just <laughs> way to do to, to put a smile on folks' face. So we're gonna watch our last Rolling. clip right now. <laughs> so what, what, what's the results of that? So the results of that, so a couple years ago at BU, we started doing a video birthday card. There, there had been print birthday cards mailed, and we did little emails, and we're like, how can we make it better? Um, it's really easy when you have a cute puppy as your mascot um, to do fun and engaging things, but we wanted to let people know in a very real way that we were excited about their birthday, and I was watching people's faces, and the, the goal of that one was we wanted people to smile and laugh, and over at this point, I had to go back and try to check the, um, the analytics on that one, but it's gotten over 20,000 views, and there's a 30% finish rate, which means people watch the cute puppy all the way to the end. And get, you, you guys know if you do analytics, a 30% finish rate is awesome. Um, and so I don't know if we've made any money from it, but hopefully if someone's open that, then they get a call they don't hit ignore, right? Because they're like, okay, they did send me the cute thing. What's going on at BU? Yeah. You know, and yeah. like we're just, again, you know, those high touch points are, are your, your sanding, video sort of becomes your primer, and then hopefully your other messages stick. I mean, I think, and, and when you said, you know, we're not sure if we made money on that, I think we could probably do a lot of view lookups and cross reference and do all these things in the back end to figure that out. Or, like Brent said this morning, like Evertrue wants to be that. We want to be able to show you, here's how that engagement funnels straight into a lifelong connection with the donor. And so, working on it, but we'll get there. How do you start? Like, how did, how did you all get started in this business? Christy, you start. Oh, God. Uh, well, I didn't even start in higher ed, but mm -hmm. um, uh, how did I start? Uh, just testing, a lot of testing, and I'm kind of not really starting over. You know, I have a lot of theories that I can reapply to a new school, um, but um, 
just testing all your theories, I guess. Generally, you have, you know, whatever your hunch is, is, is on the right track. Um, and ways you can do that are putting things out there on social media. That's one thing. Maybe start out on a small platform like a Twitter or Instagram. People are friendly on Instagram. Um, and then if it goes well there, then it might do really well on Facebook. Um, and then for things that have additional, or, you know, a, a great number of engagement on social media, try putting that in an email, in your newsletter. Um, I have tested every which way um, in email marketing. You put a video at the top, you put a video at the bottom, you put a video buried in the middle of the content. It is always the highest clicked thing. Whether they watch it all the way through, they're just curious. Um, so if there is something that you need people to know, your audience to know, that is usually a guarantee that they're going to at least click on it and start to see what you're talking about. Yeah. Uh, real quick on that, a stat. How many people sent an email today? Everybody? Everybody sent one email today. How many included a video in that email? No one? Uh, that's OK. There's still time. Uh, video uh, in an email drives clicks. It's like 236%, 236% more clicks by putting a video in an email. And we can use that on a you know, mass marketing side, and you can use that on a one-on-one -on -one outreach side as well. Austin, I mean, you showed up at BU and, and they had a great studio set up and, and they were ready yes, for you. Yes, there a was, uh, I was, Kevin Costner was there to do the first voiceovers. No, um, <laughs> so when we started, um, they hired me. They're like, great, what do you want to film on? And I said, huh? And they're like, we don't have a camera. I said, oh. So we started out with um, me. And I, I will say a plug, you don't need a whole bunch of equipment, but if you're gonna spend the money, do it on either strong FTEs or really build those external vendor relationships that are gonna know your brand and take time to understand how you wanna do it. Because again, even with the um, 110, 100, um, what they had was a brain trust of talent and know-how in terms of communication. Um, do, like, unless you have a little cousin in Idaho who um, has that, don't say, oh, well, my cousin in Idaho could do it with his iPhone. He can't do what, you know, what their guy did with an iPhone. So I would say take time, um, build the relationships, or bring people in-house who are really interested in finding new engaging ways without blowing a budget to share stories. And I really think that that's, that's the most important thing is that you, know, you have to have an objective, you have to know what stories you want to tell, and you have to be authentic um, as you do it. And the best way to do that is to lean into your talent. And if you're just one person, like what's what working as yeah. a fundraiser? Um, I think the, the th big thing that we see if you're just one person, you don't have a budget, is um, trying to make personalized videos for somebody. And so you can use a tool like Soapbox, there's a bunch of tool called Loom, there's a bunch mm -hmm. of things that are out there. Um, but there's this kind of revolution happening because Chrome changed how the fundamentals of it work so you can actually record your screen and your webcam. And the thing that's really nice about that is that you can, what we see usually is people make these videos internally. So they're like trying to explain a topic, or they're recapping a meeting that somebody missed, or they're you know, giving feedback on something, and the emotional intent comes through so clearly on video. Um, and the, all of these tools are designed, our tool is designed, if it takes two minutes to record it, within 30 seconds after, you've trimmed it, you've added transitions, you've sent it out. Um, and as you were saying earlier, like the, the response rates are really high because so many of us just want to watch something. And I, I think the key is finding small moments where you can get comfortable using video and then expanding from that as you build the confidence that, it's, that you can create stuff that's good um, or that you know where it's going to work. Um, for us as a business, we kind of accidentally started making videos that were the behind the scenes of how we work. Because we had a video platform and people kept asking us questions like, how did you like that video? You know, what camera are you using? What audio are you using? And we're like, stop asking us these questions. <laughs> and there must be questions that people are asking you. You're like, this is frustrating. This doesn't seem like this is related to what we're doing. And often those are the things that actually, if you answer those questions, you can actually build up your brand and you can build up trust and educate by answering those questions. And so I would just keep your, your ears up for what those things are. Um, because if you can be the person to answer those questions for your alumni, they're going to come back to you. Um, 
I, I was at another conference, a sales marketing conference, a couple of weeks ago, and they said your content calendar uh, should be based exclusively on the questions that you're getting, the ones that you don't, you get sick of, tired of answering. Create a blog post, put it in an email. Anything that donors keep asking you, that's something that your your marketing team should answer. Mm -hmm. So yeah. I had a little really good question, and then and then I uh, and then I lost it. Oh. What's next? What's the next project that you guys are working on and excited about? Austin, I'm going to put you on the spot. I've been talking a lot. <laughs> um, one of the things that we're really excited about at Boston Medical Center is um, recently we just got a $85 million grant um, to help reduce substance use disorder uh, deaths um, in eight communities around the Commonwealth. And so we're working on some internal um, videos that talk about that to our um, to our employees. But we're planning this, and this is the thing that I love is the strategy is taking the information that's starting in-house and then being really strategic about how we start sharing these initiatives externally with external partners, with the general public, um, about what we're doing um, as a healthcare provider, but then also how we're partnering with um, the state and national entities to really tackle this, this issue that's impacting a lot of lives. And so it's really exciting to be working on content that you know, is immediately um, meaningful and really relevant right now. That's amazing, yeah. Um, again, still new at, uh, at Emerson. So I actually have a lot of um, projects in the air right now that I'm trying to get off the ground. And some of them are really easy, low production value. Again, um, maybe video of campus to see what sticks. Um, other things are um, impact stories, um, currently working on identifying what are those programmatic, um, those easy win programmatic um, things that Emerson is doing that can, um, you know, we can build awareness with our alumni audience and also that and find out what their interest level is there. Um, so doing some low-end production, doing some high-end production, working with Phil, uh, at, who's somewhere out here. But um, um, yeah, just t uh, testing theories right now and um, starting to build the base. Testing theories. That comes up, I think all three of you have yeah. mentioned that. Just test, try it, see if it works, then refine and do it again. So the big thing we're working on right now is um, we've seen this trend that uh, as you start to make more video, if every single video is bespoke and different, it, gets hard, it can get really arduous and hard to figure out um, what your next thing should be. And so um, one of the solutions that we see to that is actually thinking of yourself as a media company and thinking about like what are the programs of content that you want to put out consistently? What's the, what is the format that you can create that actually makes it easier to make something over and over again? So the example for us at Wistia is we have a show called Brandwagon right now. And it's a show where we talk to VPs of marketing, CEOs, and other creative folks about how they're building and investing in brand. It's kind of like a talk show, tonight show vibe. Um, I am hosting it. <laughs> it's very fun. Um, but it's, it's the same set every time. It's like me at a desk and then sitting down in chairs talk with people. And so, it's one of those funny things where like the first episode probably took six hours to shoot and ended up with like a 30 minute thing. And now it takes about an hour and a half to shoot it. And just the efficiency from figuring out, like keeping it the same format has allowed us to make a ton of content that is incredibly engaging and it's actually getting easier and easier to produce. Mm -hmm. And then people are starting to expect that from our brand. And so I would say like for us, it's been unbelievably powerful. And I would, I would look at like, when you're thinking about what content you want to make, how can you make something that is really repeatable? And this can be a video, it can be a podcast, but like, what are the ways you can make things that are repeatable for your audience so you'll keep them coming back and you get them spending a lot of time with you? And with their recognition too. They're like, oh, that's that thing that yes. I watch and I expect. Absolutely. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. 100%. Yeah. Get the heads nodding. On, yeah. To add on to that, listening to your audience is really important because they, based on what their feedback is, they are driving what you should be sending to them. Um, so making sure that you are reading every single con uh, comment on your social, your social platforms. Um, do they like it? Do they hate it? Whatever. But listen, and then that will help you figure out what your next, um, your next move is. Awesome. All right, everybody. This is great. A round of applause for this panel. Thank you so much for being here. Chris, Christy, Austin. Before we transition, we're going to do a raise first. Uh, 
Austin is, is going to be our videographer. I'm going to ask Audience Chris and Christy to step down into the front. You all are going to help us film the advertisement for the next Rays event, OK? Can we, can we get house lights house, up half? How, yeah, can we go house lights up half? Hmm. Sorry, I'm working. Do I have Brent in the room? Brent's in the room. All right, so Brent's coming up stage. All right, everybody, oh boy. we're going to get ready. And Brent is going to demonstrate. They told us to take risks, so we're taking one right now. Everybody stand up. This is a long-standing tradition. Uh, called the roller coaster. We get blood flowing here before we uh, before we uh, break here. So I need everybody to pretend like you're on a roller coaster with me, and I want you to mirror what I do. Okay? Everybody loves going on roller coaster. So first, we got to buckle up. Everybody, buckle up. Buckle up. Chris is buckled up. Okay. Yeah. Pull it down. Okay. All right. We're gonna start going. We're gonna start going. We're gonna start going. And now we're going up, and we're going up, and we're going up, and we're going down! Woo! Whoa! 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 And we're going up! That's taking a risk. It worked. Here's to the roller coaster. Have fun. <laughs>